we all understand unconscious desires. But what is unconscious thought? Well, uh, as with most th things, it depends how we define it. So if we mean by thought the kind of self-talk that we're all used to doing and engaging in, then <coughs> almost by definition that is conscious. But research psychologists over the past few decades have really expanded their view of the uh, extent to which our minds operate unconsciously and the kinds of cognitive operations we can perform out of view, such things as, as learning new material, detecting patterns, uh, filtering information as it comes in, even such higher order processes as setting goals for ourselves, uh, combining information to reach decisions. All of these things which we used to think were the uh, performed only by our conscious minds, there's gathering evidence that these things can occur unconsciously as well. And you conceptualize this unconscious as you call it the adaptive unconscious. So what does that mean? Well, partly to contrast it with the Freudian unconscious. And I want to be clear, I'm, I'm not denying that there may well be a Freudian unconscious, a repository of instinctual urges that we do our best to keep hidden in the basement of our minds. Uh, the point I want to make is that there may have been a much different kind of unconscious as well that probably evolved earlier in our evolution as a species than consciousness did. The ability to transform information and, and um, think in, in ways that further our survival, hence the term adaptive. I think this kind of quick sizing up of the world, uh, interpreting information, deciding how to act can happen very quickly and, and outside of conscious view. And it's not something that's, that's buried because we don't want to know it. It's part of the architecture of the brain that is unknowable, I, I would argue. So un unknowable, that seems to say that uh, you know, what Descartes was engaged in, trying to figure out the reason why he uh, had this fetish for cross-eyed girls, uh, it seems to be an impossible exercise. Well, uh, there are various metaphors for introspection, and, and I, I think the Descartes example is an interesting one. Uh, you know, one metaphor for introspection is it's like a flashlight that we're shining in the dark, and, and we sort of flash it in the corner and discover that crease in the brain that he just hadn't bothered to, to see before. Another that Freud was fond of is introspection is archaeology. We're digging and, and digging up things that were buried deep, deep down below our minds, but if we dig hard enough, we'll find them. I think the, the metaphor I prefer is really introspection is narrative building. We're constructing stories about ourselves based on some access to desires, but, but, but not, not much, I think. A lot of it is the way we would construct a narrative about somebody else, um, observing what they do, uh, bringing our vast cultural knowledge to bear. And I'm not so sure that isn't what Descartes did in this case, that, that he deduced almost as another person might have, ah, this is the the 10th cross-eyed girl I'm attracted to, and, and I remember that one. So maybe that's, so it may not have been shining a flashlight or digging deeply. It may have, he just inferred this based on his self-observation. So you're saying we figure out about ourselves by imagining how somebody else would look at us? In part. I, I think that's actually not a bad way to try to do it, is to see our uh, see ourselves through the eyes of others. That's, that's a difficult thing to do, to get outside of our own heads and do that, but I think that is one interesting path to self-knowledge.